श्री राम माधव जी कैप्टन आलोक बंसल एंड सेक्रेटरी इज मैडम लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन इट्स अ प्लेजर फॉर मी टू बी हियर दिस मॉर्निंग एंड टॉक अबाउट कॉपरेटिव मैकेनिजम्स फॉर काउंटरिंग टेरर इन द इंडियन ओशन रीजन ऑब्वियसली माई फोकस वुड बी ऑन नेवल कॉपरेटिव मेशर्स एंड फॉर काउंटरिंग मैरी टाइम टेररिज्म इन द आई ओ आर Uh, i will take about 15 minutes i have got a scope uh, as listed out on the uh, screen and i shall go through it now uh, seas that cover about 3/4 of the earth's surface are not only a source of food and resources but is also a medium of trade and transportation and over long distances let me insist the cheapest form of transportation as was brought out the ior is the third largest water body in the world which is accessible through just seven external choke points that means you can egress uh, egress into or egress out of indian ocean region only through these seven choke, choke points and through these isls which is depicted on the uh, screen there are over 1 lakh ships that transit every year carrying world trade the statistics of the oil that is carried the trade that is carried and the container shipping that is carried uh, was brought out by the sec secretaries in their introductory remarks and it's quite clear that any disruption to these isls or to these choke points would have devastating effects uh, on global economy india in pursuance of its development agenda is also increasingly turning to the sea as a driver for india's growth story the sagar mala project and the focus on blue economy are reflective of such efforts india's foreign policy vision for the ior is summarized in the acronym sagar which actually stands for security and growth for all in the region the act east policy and project mausam also exemplifies the government's multi track approach to the ior let me move on to maritime terrorism as was rightly brought out interestingly there is no internationally accepted definition of maritime terrorism however the sua convention the principal convention for unlawful activities in the maritime domain does list out some of them statistically uh, you will also find it interesting that incidents of maritime terrorism constitute only a very small fraction of the overall total this could also be because of what was brought out the cost benefit analysis being actually against uh, maritime terrorism but yet maritime terrorism has manifested itself in many forms these include hijackings which can actually be used to get some money to fund terrorism ramming of explosive laden boats into ships that are actually trying to prevent uh, ill unlawful activities at sea uh, quite like the coal incident Uh, of 2002 a photograph of which is there on the slide and even underwater attacks uh, you may recall the ltte uh, days when there was actually an underwater attack carried out by the ltte we ourselves experienced 2611 wherein the terrorists used the sea routes to infiltrate to launch attacks on land you must also be following since october of 2016 there have been attacks on a number of warships of yemen and on merchant ships by non state actors these attacks have included missile attacks as also by surface unmanned vessels and even mines in the south china sea for example the abu sayyaf group continues to play havoc hijack and kill uh, sailors uh, for money in essence maritime terrorism has displayed an increasing hybrid nature with a characteristic of mutating into deadlier forms In addition to maritime terrorism other forms of non traditional threats to maritime security such as piracy armed robbery and trafficking whether it is gun or drug trafficking are also endemic to various sub regions in the IOR Now this has also resulted in a proliferation of private maritime security business which remains largely unregulated and remains a potential threat to maritime security The potential nexus between maritime crime and maritime terrorism and as reports indicate 
the increasing conflation of maritime crime with ideology, quite often religious ideologies, exacerbates the challenges to maritime security from non-traditional threats. With this basic introduction, let me move on to what are the cooperative mechanisms that we have. As enunciated in the Indian Maritime Security Strategy, the Indian Navy is committed to shape a favorable and positive maritime environment for enhancing net security and thereby be a net security maritime provider in the Iowa region. The Indian Navy has always been amongst the first responders to any crisis, as was the case in Maldives in 1988 when mercenaries attempted a coup against the then government. Broadly, the concept of net security envisages preserving peace, promoting stability and maintenance of security in the wider areas of interest. India's foreign cooperation endeavors are based on four pillars of capacity building, capability enhancement, constructive engagements and collaborative efforts. We believe that the most effective method to counter maritime terrorism is to enable friendly foreign countries to gain and fine-tune their capabilities. Towards this, IAN is committed towards capacity building and capability development of nations which may require such assistance. More specifically, Indian naval actions in support of this objective include present showing and rapid response to emerging threats, maritime engagement with other friendly foreign countries and conduct of specific maritime security operations. For instance, we remain deployed round the year. One such being in the Gulf of Aden, we have remained there since October of 2008, fighting pirates in the Horn of Africa and escorting merchant ships safely. Almost 90% of the ships that were escorted were actually foreign flagships. India is also an active participant in international anti-piracy forums such as the RECAP, which stands for Regional Cooperation Against Armed Piracy, and Contact Group on Piracy of the Coast of Somalia, CGPCS, and also of SHADE, Shared Awareness and Deconfliction. The Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, Mumbai, is the recap focal point for India's area of responsibility. Let me move to our ventures with other navies. The Indian navies, along with the navies of Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Myanmar, regularly undertake coordinated patrols, or what we call CORPAT, along respective international maritime boundary line. This is to prevent arm running and guns smuggling. In addition, the Indian Navy, along with the Indian Coast Guard, has been providing support to the island nations in the IOR. For instance, in Mali, we undertake an EZ patrol every month with the Maldivian Coast Guard personnel embarked on our ships. Similarly, in the islands of Mauritius and Seychelles, we conduct EZ patrols once in six months. As we speak, there are three ships which are undertaking EZ patrol uh, in the islands of Maldives, uh, sorry, Mauritius. We also undertake other HADR, NEO, and peacekeeping missions as is shown on the slide. Why I projected this is to show that the interaction is at a multi-layered uh, levels so that the sensitive issues can be addressed without much hassles if you, if you have multi-layered interaction with the other nations. The Indian Navy also has institutional exercises with a number of navies. The list is as uh, shown on the slide. Now, the scope and complexity of these exercises have continuously evolved. And today, it includes not only traditional maritime security challenges, but also the non-traditional ones. In addition, a host of other exercises of varying complexity are being undertaken with a large number of navies. These include passage exercises, which we call PASEXES, and also occasional exercises such as the RIM PAC, the RIM of Pacific exercise, which is a multilateral exercise, and also HADR exercise as a part of the ADMM+. 
if you look at the slide now, you see the operational footprint of the Indian Navy. In the last one year alone, which is in 2016, we have visited about 30 countries because we believe presence is actually deterrence. So it actually deters any unlawful activities in the seas around us. A number of operational interactions to enhance mutual understanding and operational coordination are also undertaken under the AGs of multilateral forums such as IONS and MILAN, both of which are Indian naval initiatives. In fact, the IONS includes about 35 countries today and about 17 navies participate in the biennial Milan exercise, which is coordinated by the Indian Navy at Port Blair. Over and above this, we also conduct staff talks with about 20 navies. When it comes to maritime assistance, the Indian Navy provides maritime assistance to friendly foreign nations to address specific requirements, such as those pertaining to hydrographic surveys, diving assistance, ordnance disposal, salvage, sea lift, for instance, when Maldives ran out of water because of problems with their uh, water supply, there was water which was shipped through the Indian naval tankers to Maldives. In addition, the IN is also the coordinator for Nav Area 8, a navigational warning area in the Indian Ocean region. The other strength of the Indian Navy is the training cooperation that we have with various countries. In the last 30 years alone, we have trained over 11,000 foreign personnel from about foreign countries, uh, from about 40 foreign countries. We offer about 125 courses, 25 of them for, uh, for officers and about 100 of them for sailors of all navies in the IOR. Technical cooperations such as maintenance support, technical advice, repairs and refit, transfer of hardware and construction of ships is also being undertaken for friendly foreign countries. Aircraft and ships have also been provided to friendly countries towards augmenting their capacity and capabilities. Now moving on to what we have to gain out of all this. One of the things that we have done is to enter into white shipping info agreements with various countries. This was brought out that in the last uh, IORA um, uh, meetings when our vice president represented the country, one of the focus areas was to enter into white shipping agreements. Now, we are in the process of signing agreements with 30 countries. We already have it operationalized with about nine of them. And the picture, the maritime domain as awareness picture is exchanged between the two countries which have entered into an agreement. We also have assisted four countries specifically in enhancing their maritime domain awareness by setting up coastal surveillance <laughs> radar systems for them. Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles. We are also in the process of setting up for a couple of countries more. And this picture, which is gained by those countries, would be exchanged with us in exchange for our picture to them. Now, if you look at the background of the slide, you see those green dots, the blue dots, the red dots. These are the white shipping, which transmit on uh, either the AIS or picked up by the Coastal Surveillance uh, Radar Network. Notably, post-2611, the Indian Navy has developed a national command Control, Communication and Intelligence Network, the NCQ by network. The network not only links the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard, but also fuses information from multiple sensors. For instance, we now have a coastal surveillance network, a, a series of radars. We have the national AIS chain, which is the DGLL project. We've got inputs from the LRIT, from the DG shipping. We have the space-based AIS information, which we have contracted for from one of the agencies. We also have the inputs of all our surveillance efforts, whether it is ship surveillance or the MR, uh, the maritime reconnaissance aircraft which fly in the entire IOR. And we also get the information from all the technical agreements we have entered into with various countries. So we do have a consolidated picture of maritime domain awareness of the white shipping. How this helps us is to identify the dark ships as and when we run into them. The Indian Navy is also steering a case for establishing a national MDA system which would further integrate databases and sensors of all stakeholders and agencies. Having covered all this, what are the challenges? The traditional principles of freedom of the seas 
ensures that almost all vessels, irrespective of type and intent, have almost unfettered access to the seas. Beyond 12 nautical miles, no rule applies to them. So anybody can be there in waters which is beyond 12 nautical miles of any nation and they are in the high seas. Surveillance and identification in the vast maritime domain is also another significant challenge. For instance, just out of Mumbai alone, there are about 23,000 boats, fishing boats, which sail out on a daily basis. So to keep tab on each one of them is actually a challenge. The tracking of smaller vessels which are outside the purview of international shipping regulations is, the, is another big challenge. The success of the counter-piracy effort of Somalia has been on account of the international multi-pronged cooperative and collaborative approach. Challenges to deal with maritime terrorism are only likely to be even greater, but will certainly require international cooperation and collaboration, not only among security agencies, but also other related stakeholders. Domestically, despite the significant progress made to strengthen coastal and maritime security, there remain several challenges. These include issues related to single point apex body for maritime affairs, consolidation of sensor and data sources and integration of all agencies into a national level integration system, and review of legislative framework, especially with regards to enforcement. Furthermore, Strengthening of the Indian Coast Guard and Coastal Police will be a facilitator for a wider role for the Indian Navy net maritime security provider in the IOR. Uh, so what are the focus areas? To address the challenges, some of the key areas require greater focus and these include leveraging existing international cooperative mechanisms such as the IORA, which was mentioned earlier, and the IONS, which has been a very successful naval initiative, for enhancing maritime security. Continued and focused engagement with other nations in the IOR through a whole of government approach. In so far as the maritime forces are concerned, greater traction to foreign cooperation initiatives is an imperative. Strengthening of intelligence and information sharing arrangements at the regional level, such as through the proposed IFC in the Indian Ocean region, this would need to be complemented by the National Maritime Domain Awareness System in India. Establishing an apex level body for maritime affairs, such as the proposed National Maritime Authority, would go a long way in ensuring uh, our fight against maritime terrorism. Review of the international legal framework and mature maritime security to keep pace with the challenges. Likewise, strengthening of the domestic law will also go a long way. Despite the low numbers and localized nature of maritime terrorism, such as recent incidents show, the threat from maritime terrorism in the IOR is real and has now manifested itself in even deadlier forms. The unique nature of maritime domain compounds the problems associated with monitoring and identification. The international legal framework has also not kept pace with the increasing challenges. Furthermore, while operational actions are undertaken by security forces, effectively dealing with international maritime terrorism also needs complementary actions by other nations and stakeholders to comprehensively address the issue. The Indian Navy continues to be committed towards anchoring stability and security and thereby national development. Thank you very much.